Hello and welcome to the 140th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 26th of November 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This is part five of our dialogue with Arnold Schroeder, the man behind the Fight Like an Animal podcast. The sixth and final part of the series will be released as a patron only episode next week. So if this stuff floats your boat, head on over to Patreon and throw me some coin. It really does help me keep the episodes flowing. This week, I have the new patron, Paul Serafini, to thank. The voting for the next Reading Group series is also well underway, with Eric Olin Wright's Understanding Class in an early lead, followed closely by Breyer's Accounting for Value in Marxist Capital, with the Econophysics classic Laws of Chaos and evolutionary theory barnstormer Evolution in Four Dimensions making up the rear. So if you want to vote, head over to the Patreon. Okay, let's rejoin the dialogue. So talking of, of that, we probably it's worth us examining, say, the political tendencies we both come out of with respect to this insight and uh, insights you have. Now, from my so I might as well, you know, you're new to my podcast. You've listened to a couple of episodes, so you won't maybe get what my podcast and other podcasts in our network are kind of about. We're about kind of looking at using like history, economics, science to and, you know, research to analyze like the failures of radical, you know, the communist, anarchist, whatever we want to call it, movement. You know, the the network, the people on the network are probably like a, a bunch of weirdo Marxists slash people who came through either anarchist groups and got disillusioned or uh, Leninist groups got disillusioned, but like kind of don't like the ossified structures that we have inherited from, you know, essentially a hundred or most of the politics is a hundred years old and, you know, seeking new synthesis, you know, with respect to like cybernetics, maybe better understanding of economic theory history and politics you name it but so that's the kind of the gist and like one of the things that like that we kind of rebel against like from a marxist kind of point of view is the this ossified nature of the structure of say marxist parties as these kind of like central committee driven top-down structures structures that you know claim this kind of mantle of democratic centralism whereby you everybody agrees and they debate openly on a topic and you you decide what your action is going to be and then you act in a unified manner towards that but in reality that's not that's not how they operate in reality and 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 concomitantly then also we have like the anarchist approach where like we have this tendency to go against structure you know like the hierarchical structure like one thing i would say is that like you know, our human bodies, from a cybernetic point of view, our human bodies are a hierarchical organization. But it it's not hierarchical in the sense that, like, one part of your body controls everything else and tells everything else what to do. For example, like, you don't tell your heart what to do with your head. You know, you've got all these different systems. But there is, like, levels of operation and abstraction that different parts work on. Marxists critique anarchists, you know, they say, oh the tyranny of structurelessness yeah and the anarchists say the tyranny of structure <laughs> yeah and they're both right yeah so like from from what we're trying to work towards and understand is like taking stuff like what you have talked about and you know critiques from all sides of this radical spectrum to build structures that can meet those needs that we're talking about and defend from the problems that we can see playing in front of us from our own, both our experience. Like you don't need, you know, to be a, a neuroscientist to see the problems of what has gone on in our, our radical politics, but it, it sure as hell helps that you can see them from a scientific point of view that's like abstracted away from internal left bullshit. So to that end, like, you know, one of the things that I think looking at, say, the experience of, say, you know, we'll talk about uh, your experience coming through like the radical 
anarchist eco kind of scene that's uh, whatever you want to call it i'll just give it an i'll give it that name you tell me if it's a bullshit name but um it's like that the the focus uh seems to have been it's a it's a very it's a it's a tough nut to crack because you have this existential crisis a crisis that we think that is existential but like acting without massive without building a movement and a support when you act as the isolated unit it's like I think we've seen that that's not an effective strategy. What do you think about that? That's a long question. I don't know what the fuck you're going to say now. <laughs> I said about, I talked for two minutes there, sorry. Oh, yeah, no worries. I mean, yeah, I think that, well, I I think that how I would amend it, the that final statement you made is just that I think we've seen that it's not a, an effective strategy if it doesn't exist as a complement to a huge range of other things that have to be happening in concert, right? Yeah, that's that's what that's my point. Like, it needs a social base for it to like have social effect. Totally, and and so like one of the, one of the ways that I tend to characterize uh, like factional infighting along you know, ideological or kind of any other line in, in like any, in like the whole like broad egalitarian ecological political landscape is that often like, I think that there's a whole lot of necessary, but not sufficient conditions, like a whole lot of different things that have to happen, components of any like plausible political project to affect fundamental change And because of a sense of powerlessness and a a number of other factors, people tend to be, they tend to be like doing one part of that, of that very, like one small part of that very big landscape, but instead of seeing it as something that must inevitably exist in a complementary relationship with a bunch of other things, they, they see what they're doing as like the path, the way, and anybody who's doing anything else as being you know like wrong and and i don't like i don't want to totally like i don't want to negate like the the idea of ideological difference being meaningful in general but like but oftentimes like like yes if somebody puts a gun to my head and is like check a box of political orientation i'll check the anarchist box you know i'm I'm like okay sure I, i guess i'm an anarchist if i'm anything but often for me what that has really like what that functionally means is not that I'm trying to convert everybody to like my perspective kind of really at all, like a way to conceive of myself as an anarchist, again, to like look at this landscape of innate variation that maps out to, to political perspective is to say like, that just means that I am like, it describes literally who I am as opposed to like an explicit model for how like a whole society should operate or how an entire movement to change a society should operate. And that's like a really different, like, I think that, I think that like what, what you get out of looking at all, all of this science of innate variation that I'm talking about is a stronger sense that people really are going to have different perspectives all the time. And the question then does becomes not how to convert everybody to your perspective, but how to map out all the perspectives and all the tendencies and kind of like reconcile them into some functional meta entity that is actually useful at, you know, in its, in its emergent whole as something that's more than the sum of its parts to be all systems theory about it. And so, and so that, that really is like, and I feel like this is not me talking shit. It's not like, this is me like retreating from my whole lifetime of just hanging out with people who wear all black and mask up every time they do anything and being like, no, we should like, like I've actually spent way more. I mean, I've pretty much spent all of my political energy and time organizing stuff that, that had no ideological front loading whatsoever. That was never, ever, ever like, we are anarchists and we are organizing in a prefigurative manner to create a society without hierarchy or whatever. Like, and, and if I'm being totally honest, like when I see those kind of anarchists, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to run the other way. Like, this is not my thing, you know, like, and like, uh, like just in terms of like the particular kinds of drama and the like often sort of like pointless things that I end up seeing those people do. I'm like, cool, you guys do you. And, it, and it's like, it's another component of like this whole vast landscape. Like probably what you guys are doing is necessary, 
but it's really, really not my thing, you know? And so like, I've spent, I've spent my life like working with liberals, working with people who have no, who like would not tell you they had any particular ideological persuasion whatsoever, working, working with Marxists, working with all kinds of different people. And like, so for me, the orientation is always towards a useful, a useful project way more so than any kind of like ideological homogeneity of any kind. I feel like what I'm doing with the podcast in particular could potentially be applied by people with a lot of different perspectives that it's not really telling people like the specific course of action or the specific set of conclusions to draw from the variables. I'm really trying to orient people towards a bunch of variables that I think are important to factor into their work and their analysis, whether they're like progressive Democrats or like socialist alternative people or insurrectionary anarchists or whether they share my sort of idiosyncratic and rare, you know, type of like eco-militant, anarchist-influenced, earth firsty kind of perspective. I think that some of the things that like come from your theory or the, the different scientific papers that you're, you're pointing towards should totally inform our structures political structures yeah exactly and i think that the political structures personally i don't think it takes a brain genius to get political structures that I- I implement your stuff i think some of them have been sitting around for a while in in general but I, it seems to me that like the problem we have is is that we do not have good strategic thinking at a kind of a meta level for revolutionary politics and that what we have are obsolete forms say for example like you're a chess player and you're still playing 1910 chess theory (laughs) right what's going to happen to you and that's exactly where we are (laughs) yeah we're going to get our ass handed to ourselves okay and that like one thing I, i i feel deeply is that like i feel like that like marxists that I, I feel that are of the ilk of Marx and not like Stalinists or Leninist fans. Like, I think that we agree on the destination largely that what we want and that we don't have, n- neither camps have much strategic thought like and, 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 and meta thinking. We, we seem to, like, if, if you go and you look at all, nearly all the famous I'm not going to say all the famous anarchists, but I'd say, like, I'm talking about, uh, well, I was going to say Marxists first, but I think most of the prominent Marxists and anarchists, their politics actually aligns with New Deal politics. And, you know, to me, that's just, it's just the pit. It is always such a bummer, especially because it can take a really long time to catch on to that fact. You can... You can engage a thinker for a really long time before you're like, oh, he, he's he's kind of just a New Deal Democrat or, or whatever. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that w- one way to talk about this, to talk about these different political tendencies and how they can potentially complement one another in a in a sort of like in a broadly in a broad scale strategic sense you know, so, okay. Cause so like, I'm an anarchist. So unsurprisingly, I think a lot about like parallelism and dual power structures and, and all this kind of thing. Right. And, um, there's this, there's this book that I, I got so much out of called dancing with dynamite social movements in States in Latin America. It was published by AK press. So I assume the author was an anarchist, but, but what he talks about is how in the nineties, a bunch of, a bunch of, left governments came to power in Latin America out of social movements, right? And so there, you know, there's an electoral process and there's some, and, you know, and a lot of these entities were like ideologically explicitly Marxist, or at least you could, you could get some pretty Marxist stuff out of a lot of what they were saying. But then he, he documents because, because it happened in a bunch of different countries that were subject to broadly similar 
historical conditions because they all had some fucking coup that the United States orchestrated somewhere in the last few decades. And they had all had some kind of horrible like death squad situation, you know, like they're like economically and in terms of political history, they, they had broadly similar circumstances. And what he tries to document is how, again, speaking of necessary, but not sufficient conditions, how both the the like formal institutional political structure was necessary. Like the countries where they really made some progress towards their goals were countries where there was both a formal institutional political like structure that reflected these values, you know, like that was kind of more like a Marxist organization, essentially that, that took some like power in an institutional sense. But that also, like, if that was the only thing that happened, and sometimes that was because there's, you know, there's a tendency to be like, okay, we won. Like, why are we going to take the streets? Why blockade anything? But that it was actually really necessary for those, like, street level movements to continue to exist for any of the, for the, like, progress to really happen, right? So, like, we can think of these structures as sort of more intrinsically anarchist, like a street blockade, you know, it's like a very emergent, you know, like the decision making is going to be much less centralized. It's going to be like way less clear who decision makers are. I, I think that like, as, as like what we see playing out around the world right now, there's like, there's tons of social rupture playing out all over the place, but there's very much this sort of insurrectionary dead end thing that's happening where a lot of people have like taken essentially like without explicitly saying they're anarchists from, you know, like from Hong Kong to Chile to wherever there are all these sort of militant street movements that are operating in, you know, like an extremely decentralized, pretty like anarchistic fashion. And you can see how they're like, they're making an impact. They're setting a framework for something to happen, but they're also like universally at this sort of impasse where there's like, there's something that there's something else that clearly needs to exist. And, and, and without it, it's just more fires in the street. And even people like me who doesn't mind a good fire in the street every once in a while are like, this feels like a dead end, you know, like it feels like, yeah, like it, like one of the podcasts in the network general intellect unit, they, they're into cybernetics and the theories of Stafford beer. And like these, this idea that like, you know, he he comes from analyzing like cybernetics comes from analyzing biology, essentially biological systems to understand like how like, you know, human or a cell or, or whatever the hell manages to propagate itself through time. And what are the core similar levels of functions? And they break it down essentially into five systems system imaginatively called system one, two, three, four and five. Uh, but like it would seem like that if we were to look at the phenomenon of the like things like Occupy, say, for example, another example, what's happening in Hong Kong, Chile, the streets in America, the George Floyd protest, similarly, that they they don't have a long existing coherence is one problem with their structure. It's like you have your 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 spontaneous riot, your rebellion or whatever. But they're like once and they will inevitably like, you know, there has never been a riot in human history that's never that has gone on forever. Like there's not just like one riot in Somalia that's still going from 1121. They have a life life cycle and that they have their own organic structure, but they don't have the structure necessary to for it as a political system to propagate itself. You know, it, it can't live. Like there's something fundamentally structurally incoherent about that kind of model for uprising that has never shown itself to cohere to something. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's um, an another way that this because uh, I, I think that this this sort of like theoretical conflict, certainly, obviously, it plays out as a like Marxism versus anarchism type of discussion. But. I'd say it actually plays out in like a bunch of infinite different frames. Like one that has come up a lot in my organizing experience is the sort of like Piven and Cloward poor people's movements versus Saul Alinsky rules for radicals debate, which is, it's the exact same debate. It's like, should we build long-term institutional structures that have all this like, you know, internal coherence and like a real capacity for longevity? And should they orient towards like, 
meeting meeting needs that build like a broad base of power that's that's the Saul Alinsky rules for radicals model or should we go Piven and Cloud and be like no nothing really happens like it'll it'll just be like boring and then everything will be on fire you know and and those are the only moments when anything changes and it's all totally emergent and you just have to like you just have to see what happens in those movements and those moments and the best you can do is like try to lay some kind of groundwork but ultimately you're just waiting you're just waiting for the the great moment of rupture you know and and again like you know like in response to the question of who's right i'm like yes <laughs> you know like these are both necessary but not sufficient Fish conditions, conditions. Mm. In, in isolation neither of them will prevail and the more time that we spend so again, like, you know, like why I think applying this idea that people have innate predispositions to one form of, of like being and organizing over another, you know, like the more that we spend arguing about what's a good idea and a bad idea, as opposed to just like robustly developing all of our sort of like complementary approaches in some kind of like coherently complementary way, uh, you know, like the, like the less progress we'll make. So like, you know, like for me personally, I mean, I'm about to be back in Portland where I've probably spent more of my time in life than anywhere else. And, you know, and I'm going to do some really typical anarchist shit. Like I'm going to try to build some like parallel institution kind of stuff to deal with, to deal with some of the like scarcity that's happening right there. And to also try to like essentially formulate like a set of ecological policies that exist outside of the institutional structure of like either Portland city politics or any other. But I, but I also am like really excited. Like I'm also, you know, I mean, and maybe this just makes me not an anarchist, but I'm phone banking for a Portland mayoral candidate because I don't think what I want to do will go very far if I don't have her in office, you know? And that's just like, that's my perspective. Like, like there, it says something about me to say I'm an anarchist. Like I'm never going to run for office. I'm never even going to work for somebody in office. Like I'm going to go, I'm always going to be like building the parallel institutions and all that. Uh, like my meetings will always be consensus processes, but I don't think that that's, that's not the sum total of the political process and failing to understand that is catastrophic. There was one science question. I know we're going such a long time now here. I have a couple of quick ones. These are going to go a bit all over the place. When it comes down to the the when it comes down to the genetic stuff and the developmental stuff linked to aggression and say conservative outlook, maybe this is a dumb question. What like contribution does genetics seem to play, if any, and what compared to experience or material conditions? Yeah, I mean, so they've they've done the same heritability studies related to this question that they've done for a huge number of traits. And so like the the basic framework of how they establish like the genetic contribution to like height even, but you know, but certainly more like complex, you know, like your performance on a certain kind of cognitive test or whatever or how you vote is all like, it's this really interesting, it's they, they take identical, they take genetically identical twins who have been raised apart and use that as a, like as a basis for comparison to like qu try to quantify the respective environmental and genetic contributions to a given trait. And so you get these, you get these factors, you get like a heritability, like you say something has like high heritability if it's say, you know, if say like the, the correlation coefficient is above like 0.5 or something like that. Right. And so the, like they've done that with like, at this point, like that type of research has been replicated in a bunch of different settings, a bunch of different places in the United States and Australia and with, with huge, huge sample sizes. Like one, one of the studies had 30,000 twins in it, which I was like, I was honestly surprised they could find so many <laughs> genetically identical twins raised apart. But that, that research was a subset. Like there's some really long-term projects that just look like have a huge twin database and they're, they're just kind of going through traits and, and estimating respective contributions. So, you know, like, so we do know that that, you know, that, yeah, your actual genetic inheritance does, it does play a role. I mean, again, I'll emphasize, like, I think that 
the the difference is not in what programs we have. I think we all have the we all have an identical set of programs somewhere in there, but it's just in terms of how like the thresholds for starting one over the other, I think are, are much, you know, like that's where the bias is. And this is, this is one of the reasons that we see a normal distribution of like political perspectives. Like that's a, that's a cross-cultural truth. There's research that's looked at like left, right political orientations in a huge number of different countries that do not have similar political, economic, social, like backgrounds or trajectories at all. And first of all, yes, people do feel comfortable, like they understand what left, right means, and it means something to them, and they are capable of putting themselves somewhere on a spectrum. But what's so fascinating is that these these responses to those questions cross-culturally form normal distributions, which is something that like is true of a lot of innate traits, like, you know, so does height, so does blood pressure, a, a lot of a lot of innate traits form normal distributions. So like that has consequences. You know, like what's like, what's really fascinating to think about in those terms is like, I, that, I think that's a big explanatory framework for why left, right conflicts, not only are so recurrent, so like not only occur in so many different social contexts, but also why they're so fucking close over and over again. Why, you know, like why it all, it always seems like there's like an, a virtually even sort of like proportion of the population orienting towards two different narratives, right? Uh, I would push back on that a little bit because I would say that all the countries that people are being analyzed on, they're all class societies. Totally, totally. Yeah. And like most of them, like the vast majority of people in the world now live in capitalist relations. Some live in kind of, you know, the the agrarian relation you know as opposed to a proletarian relation i think the proletariat is now globally i think urban dwelling so that'd be a a proxy for proletariat is like 55 45 to to peasant but even the peasant still lives in a market society where they have to sell their their grain and that some of them there might be a few hold out feudal elements like bhutan or somewhere but like it's it's broadly the same class structure So I would think the left-right politics is a function of that. Like, we don't have a vast hunter-gatherer or communist society to see what the breakdown of left-right would be. Like, I think if you're in an egalitarian hunter-gatherer society from 5,000 years ago, you know, egalitarian, you know, inverted commas, like, it'd be interesting to see what their score would be on if you could describe to them a life, a a right-left divide. You know what I mean? I mean, totally like the, the right left divide, this is an important, it's important to acknowledge that it only exists beyond certain thresholds of technological and social complexity, which so far in the human experience correspond to thresholds of like social differentiation and hierarchy. So like, yeah, all of these societies that I'm talking about, they have vastly different conditions in terms of like how rich or poor they are, you know, like what deities they worship, but they, yeah, they, they are all totally uniform in having a very stratified structure and having a small minority who, you know, like essentially controls everybody else's wealth and, and lives and all that. And so, I mean, I think that we can gain some insights, but it's fundamentally true that this divide did not characterize uh, hunter-gatherer societies in like, at least in a way where it was like a basis for overt conflict that like defined the society. Right. I do think there is some evidence. Like we talked in the last episode about that anthropologist who went and studied it's pronounced and spelled a few different ways, but like the Yanomamo or however it's pronounced in the Amazon, but, you know, and he's, he's kind of famous for giving them these weapons that they then, you know, use to like greatly amplify the scale of their violence. But he also talks, I mean, as much as, as much as there's some valid critiques of, of Napoleon Chagnon, I mean, he, he did bring back some information. And one of the things that he did, he did talk about was how some, but not all people in that society would have these moments of reflection where they were like, I just wish this would stop. Like, this is crazy, you know, and I would like to not engage in this level of like 
constant reciprocal aggression that guarantees no good outcome, you know, and, but in fact guarantees that eventually I'm going to die a violent death after I've killed a bunch of people. Right. And so like, I, and, and I do actually think like, if you really dig into the hunter gatherer literature, you can see more or less egalitarian versions of that lifestyle. There's a really, really strong tendency, no matter where people are coming from, whether people are like the Steven Pinkers of the world and they're like, it's great that technology is progressing and we're all getting less violent and hunter-gatherer life was terrible, or whether it's like the anarcho-primitivist, like civilization is an abomination and we all lived like gentle, egalitarian, beautiful, interconnected lives a long time ago. There's a very strong tendency to reduce social outcomes purely to like subsistence mode, to like say that hunter-gatherers were monolithically one way or the other. And I think that really, I don't think there's, I, I think that like it is true that once once we reached certain levels of technological development, we can't really find a society that's not highly stratified. But I think that there's way more heterogeneity in hunter-gatherer societies than people often assume. And I, I personally really do agree with David Graeber and others, and it's a conclusion I came to independently that when we find like the reason for that is because of actual like decisions that people made and like conflicts that that probably did happen and that like the impulse for domination that has been so successful in our modern hyper technological societies did exist. I think some individuals probably exhibited that more than others in more traditional societies. You could say those individuals had more of a right-wing psychology and also distinct from ideology, more of a like that kind of like power mad, like the, the Donald Trump psychology or whatever, you know, like I think that those individuals were probably around, but because technology was less intense, because the scale was smaller, it was much easier for people to like push back on that and, and like, create other kinds of social forms that had like there's the chief yeah there's the chief he's an asshole i've got a spear i can fucking kill him exactly exactly and that's like that's this fundamental rupture like when you when it's no longer actually plausible for a group of individuals to say like i just don't want to live under this person's control let's like exile them or or like let's literally just walk away like let's just go somewhere else you know or or whatever like i like that one <laughs> that happens like that's a known that's an aspect of hunter gatherer life they call them fusion fission societies cuz people get to these points where they're like Fuck you, I'm just man. done with <laughs> this, bad. right? And that's an option that is fun. That's a, essential to our evolved psychological architecture, and it is an option that is totally denied <laughs> us. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, no, that's true. That'd be good. You see, like Ireland just moving slowly away from England. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're done. We're done. This yeah, didn't we've work. Had enough. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting divorced. Guys. We're out of here. <laughs> Right, I got so look. I think we've got through everything. I got one last tiny bit. Well, it's not tiny. It's really fucking meaty. But it's one last bit. I, I, I'll say it because it's baffling to me. Okay, I don't know. Like maybe you know, our brain structure is more prone to picking up. Ba- this is this is one thing I analyze about myself. Like when I first got into like radical politics, I, I came across peak oil, and peak oil was one of these kind of doomsday scenario things and i do think the science behind peak oil is correct but whether the effect of oil peaking is going to be what people will say abstract away from eco i mean like climate change just from like systemic failure due to energy throughputs in a society whether that's right or wrong right or wrong like i picked up on that and got quite into it and my one of like my best friends i was his best i was best man at his wedding he's like a professor of of atmospheric science in like i won't name him or say which college but like probably the top he's like a tenured professor in, in like the top event uh, uh, uh one in america which is probably like the top one in the world right like you know let, let's be honest one of one of the top three or four places in the world like top guy and like i talked to him about climate change and it's like i'm talking to a mainstream politician it's i find it very very weird i just kind of find it very disconcerting like have you come across that phenomenon yeah and it's 
It's something that I try. Okay. So yeah. And I have like a bunch of really strong opinions about it. And it's something that I've actually, I feel like people, you know, people often talk about organizing different sectors of society in a thing that I've been like having this, like this recurrent conversation with people about for years, but I'm, I'm never really sure of like what concrete steps I could take, especially because I exist totally outside of academia, you know, but like, I've, I'm always like, scientists need to organize like scientists need to stop conceptualizing themselves as these like neutral arbiters of truth who dispense information to this like supposedly hyper rational public who's all like you know like all those enlightenment notions that we're all like racing towards history towards some great consensus or whatever you know and like climate science is just going to be part of it and start like actually like contending for power like stop stop saying like ice shelves are are melting like somebody should do something and start like trying to intervene in some way because i do think there's some unique forms of power that people who are in like prestigious positions of science and in like technical institutions and stuff like that i think they have some unique i mean just like janitors have some unique power like obviously scientists have some unique power but then right so like that's like on a good day like when when i'm like orienting towards the parts of humanity, the aspects of humanity I like better. That's kind of what I'm thinking about is all the scientists who do feel tons of crazy desperation, but are are insisting on like staying within these really specific channels that just aren't really working, but totally like there's this other, and I would say like, honestly, much larger faction of, of like climate scientists and ecological scientists in general, who just like, I don't even know how to characterize where they're coming from. Like, I literally don't understand it. I mean, I guess, I guess it's one of those things like talking about the, the cult and like the sense of belonging or whatever, like people just take so many more cues from other people and from social facts a lot of the time than they do from external conditions. And that's true. Even if you happen to be this like brilliant scientist who's like doing all this math and whatever to describe how we're in like total crisis, you know? And it's like, it's just so, and I don't know, I don't know what to do about it. I see some indications. I see some indications that at least like some of those cultural realities are starting to change where more and more scientists are showing some comfort with trying to directly intervene in the political process rather than just like provide information that's supposedly neutral. There's, you know, like in, in the United States, there's a, a climate scientist who's running for Senate in Wyoming. And that's her explicit premise is she's like, like her ad is like this ad I've been waiting for forever, where it's like a montage of people, senators saying, I'm not a scientist. And then, you know, like cut to her being like, well, I am a scientist and we're in trouble, you know? And I'm like, that's, that actually like really, like that really touched me emotionally because I'm it. I, yeah, I, I don't understand it. And like, I don't like, I don't have a background in academia, right? Like I did not, I I didn't like go to grad school or anything like that. And I feel like, I feel like a bunch of the answers must just lie in academic culture. And it's like, it's stuff that's a little bit beyond me, but I feel like people get enculturated into some like really deferential weird. And it's like, it's like the, the level of system justification is mind boggling. Like as, as, the ecological situation has progressed. And as it's become more and more obvious that those in power, yes, will in fact allow the worst case scenarios to play out. I would almost say the, the need for certain factions of scientists to insist that like a meaningful response to the climate crisis is somehow a sociopolitical inevitability has grown. Like after the 2015 Paris climate talks I, I noted like, you know, cause those were a disaster. Those were like, those were like everybody signing like a death warrant for, for the planet. I noticed all of these papers came out that just literally like explicitly said that it was inevitable, like just assumed that, you know, that we were like somehow going to rapidly decarbonize and would just kind of use this like really technical language. Like the only thing left to do is do like a feasibility assessment, like an economic assessment or whatever. And like, just never acknowledge what's actually happening politically or geophysically. So, I mean, yeah, I've encountered that and it, and it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, 
I don't want to slag my mate too much. <laughs> I'm like, where do I go with this one? Hmm. Uh, hopefully he doesn't listen to the podcast anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, but it, it, like, I also think like there's a lot of class stuff into it. Like, as in, like, academia is so goddamn competitive. Yeah. You know, it's so much about career. To get on in academia, like, you have to basically, if you're in a relationship, one person has to basically move with the other person's job like all my academic friends like one of them one of the couple typically the man uh <laughs> will like move move around and their missus will have to change job right. and go with them and it's like it's all about you know it, it, it's it's career driven but also then they get they get rich they don't get rich rich but they get a, they basically get a communist lifestyle <laughs> right you know, they get paid to essentially do what they like to do what they study. And they uh, they work in like scientific community, which is basically a communist kind of setup. You know, everything is open and free for everybody. And we all interact and talk, you know, discuss like, oh, you know, about theory and this is right and that's wrong and blah, blah, blah. And so like they have a very comfortable lifestyle. And if they if you rock the boat too much and go out like and uh, blow up some pipelines, you get sacked. You know, it, I mean, exactly. And I, and I guess like, I guess that really, it kind of is just exactly that simple. It's like, it just really illustrates the power of giving people something to lose, right? There really is a politics of people with something to lose. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like completely alienated from and, and hugely skeptical of academia itself, even though I spend all my time consuming like the output of academics, you know, like that it's like here, here again, we have the, like, we have the, the converging like material analysis with the, with like the innate, you know, like not everybody is born to like read scientific papers, but my personal experience of it was like, I started, I started avidly reading scientific papers in a college library in Albuquerque when I was just like a homeless kid who slept on the streets in Albuquerque. Right. And so that led me to one set of like behaviors in response to what science is saying. But then, you know, yeah, exactly. Like if instead of that, I had been like given a, a really comfortable career and like a life where all I had to do was like write and talk and I was rewarded for it with like a, a big house and like a lot of esteem probably would have done some different things. But again, like some people are breaking ranks. I, you know, like I really respect James Hansen, that, that climate scientist here in the United States for coming to, for not only like I can, I can, I have very distinct memories of reading some of his papers 10 years ago and really like psychologically integrating how, how far along this trajectory we are, but also cause he came and testified at the trial of a friend of mine in North Dakota who, you know, who like shut down a pipeline and was on his way to prison. And he, you know, and he was saying like, as a scientist, I like, I, be I believe that like the socio-political response, like political reality and physical reality basically have nothing to do with each other in this regard. And like, as a scientist, I'm saying it's time to shut down some pipelines, you know? And, and so like some people are breaking ranks and because people do take cues from their peers more than they do from external reality. That's that's a thing that the behavioral science teaches us or that just life teaches us. I, I kind of hope, like, I hope there can be some threshold effect. I hope that enough people like that woman running for Senate, enough people like James Hansen can do their thing, that it no longer becomes, like, somehow being, like, politically disengaged and being, like, respectable and credible credible got really conflated in academia and i hope that that can break and it can it can become more seen as like actually really not a credible approach to just live in academic comfort and you know and not try to intervene yeah i would just say that i think that academia has always been a place for people who don't rock the boat it has you know, it's like even like if you go at like times that are famously rebellious, like the 60s and that, like it'd be a tiny minority that actually rebels yeah. in any, <laughs> any way, you know, like you ever hear Chomsky talking about like when he'd be in MIT and everybody when he went there, everybody's wearing like a blazer and a tie when he started in MIT, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, you know, like students who were in blazers. And you're like, what the fuck? Get out of here. Well, here, Arnold, that's been a two and a half hour monster. Is there anything that we haven't... I know we, we went all over the place. 
Yeah, I, I'll just make I'll make my like my sweeping my sweeping existential appeal here at the end, so that we don't so that the note we're not ending on is academics are kind of conformists, you know, use, useless individuals, which is just that. I, th- I think that a lot of the resistance that we encounter in egalitarian politics to incorporating a biological behavioral scientific approach just comes out of fear that it says that, you know, the societies that we want to create aren't possible or incompatible with human nature or whatever. And so just to like, just to like really zoom out into like, into like a, a pretty like vast systemic perspective on it. I think like, you know, just reading a biology textbook or whatever, uh, you know, like what you get out of, out of that is this, this history of life on earth is really a history of entities achieving greater and greater degrees of cooperation and functional integration with one another, you know, from molecules to cells, to multicellular life, to social life. And so in that sense, like if the problem that we're confronted with is how to make a society that's more based on cooperation, as much as human behavior at any given moment can make that seem really like a quixotic approach, it's actually very, it actually is the direction that like the universe and the earth seem to be evolving towards is towards like entities engaging in greater and greater degrees of like functional coordination and cooperation and greater degrees of cohesion. So I don't know, that's a good, because believing that a better world is possible is the requisite. It's like, it's the predicate of doing any kind of revolutionary politics and those moments of despair and they, they are frequent. That's, that's, that's where I go. <laughs> thermodynamics. Thermo motherfucking dynamics. <laughs> it's, all, it's all thermodynamics. I remember reading some research there a while ago. It's like some physics guy and he had modeled like a, a soup of chemicals and a heat source like a sun and that you know if you leave it for you know you pro you run it for like a billion years or something that the the structures will form more and more when you've got an energy source going through it's they actually self-organize into complex structures now they didn't get towards life but they got to radically higher levels of complexity than you would have thought from just the initial soup of chemicals like you don't just end up with nacl or something you know that's that's (laughs) exactly it's a fundamental property of the universe and we wouldn't be sitting here having a conversation you know like this vast collection of all these different like entities that used to exist in a totally disparate fashion in the universe if it wasn't a fundamental property of the reality we occupy for whatever reason it's a it's a pretty counterintuitive fact a lot of the time it's like one of those strange bewildering like you can spend your whole life contemplating it but it is it is how the world we live in is built so there there's hope there i have a question for you then like last question before we head off is uh which comes first right like anarcho-communist utopia or heat death (laughs) uh i yeah i mean i i I think anarcho-communist utopia I, i i think i really do you know Right okay. answer, right answer. <laughs> <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> you can you can join my organization. There's two of us now. Yeah, there's two you of us. You can be my secretary. <laughs> I'll be the leader for okay. life. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> joke, joke. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats.